Hello and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the RSA. I'm Rowan Conway. I'm Director of Innovation here at the RSA and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's lunchtime event. Before we begin, can you please turn your mobiles onto silent? Um, but we are live streaming over the web, so welcome to those of us joining online. And please, if you do have your mobiles on, you can join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag RSA Intangibles. It's somewhere there. Um, now, with housekeeping notices over, it's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest speakers today, Deanne Westlake and Jonathan Haskell. Stian is one of the country's leading thinkers, Stian, leading thinkers, um, on innovation policy and practice. A senior fellow at Nesta, where he previously led their research team, he's currently posted at Bayes as an advisor to science, innovation and universities minister. Jonathan Haskell is professor of economics at Imperial College Business School and a member of many distinguished advisory boards and editorial boards. Jonathan led the Imperial team that includes Stian in, on the winning entry of the 2017 Indigo Prize, a major new award that challenges entrants to consider how to measure economic activity in a 21st century economy. Stian and Jonathan have also been working closely together on a new book, Capitalism Without Capital, which they've joined us this afternoon to discuss. In their book and in their talk with us here today, they will explore the impact of what they've called a very quiet revolution of the early 21st century. What they identify is a significant shift in economic activity, where for the first time, the major developed economies have begun to invest more in intangible assets like design, branding, R&D and software than they are in tangible assets, the physical stuff that we can touch and feel like machineries, building and kit. But what does this new economy mean to the way we do business? And how does it link to the levels of productivity and inequality what are the wider implications of technological process, progress for the ways we work, innovate and educate in the future? These are just the sorts of questions we're addressing across several of our current research projects here at the RSA. So there are an awful lot of synergies in this work with the work that we're doing. So it's a really great pleasure to be able to pick the brains of two great thinkers at the forefront of their fields today. After Stian and Jonathan's opening presentation, I'll be engaging them in some follow-up questions before opening the discussion to the floor. So think about... Think about their slides and, and how you might um, ask them some questions because there will be plenty of time for your comments and questions before we wrap up at two o'clock. But enough about me and enough, about, enough from me. Without further ado, let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Stian Westlake and Jonathan Haskell. Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Rowan. Thank you all very much indeed for coming on this kind of windy and blustery day uh, and to people for joining us uh, on the internet. So, as Rowan was kindly saying, uh, this is our uh, book uh, that Stian and I have tried to write. And what we're going to do is this. The book is in, if I can get this slide projector working. There we are. I beg your pardon. I'm pressing the wrong button. The book's in three parts. Uh, Stian's going to talk about the interesting parts, namely section two on why intangible capital is different and section three on what, what does this mean. And I'm going to start by talking about the even more interesting part, which is documenting the rise uh, in intangible capital. So let's just get, get going straight away. Um, uh, the first part of our book talks about the rise in the intangible economy. So let's have a little see as to what that is. The core of our book is the following observation. We think that the nature of investment and capital assets in the economy is changing. How is it changing? Here are the types of tangible investments everybody will be familiar with. Now, especially, we've got some people here from the financial side of things, especially if you've been on, uh, done any, ever done any accountancy. Uh, everybody knows what the tangible investments that firms make are. They're buildings, computers, plant machinery, and vehicles. And when we developed our accounting procedures, be they company accounting procedures or be they national income accounting procedures, those were the types of assets which accountants are very good at counting at. Typically, go, they've got lots of markets, and so accountants know how to value them. Those are the kind of assets uh, that when we talk about uh, the success or otherwise of firms, we say uh, the, this is what the firms are employing. However, uh, on the right-hand side are a set of investments that we think over the years have become much more important. And they are investments which we call intangible investments, investments that you can, can't touch and you can't feel. And what are they? Things like R&D, training, design, the development of an organisation itself, 
Brands and marketing, here's a famous artistic original you'll all be familiar with, software and data. And the core of our case is that the economy is switching over from a type of economy which mostly makes these tangible investments to one which mostly makes those intangible investments. Now, uh, to be, I just want to be clear about what investment is. It's what happens when a producer acquires a fixed asset or spends resources to improve it. So here's a quote from the UN system of national accounts. I know this is not everybody's bedtime reading, but the reason I wanted to say this is this. If you listen on, you know, for example, financial programs on the radio and all that kind of thing, often, especially after the budget, they talk about the mood of investors. And typically, the mood of investors means people on the stock market. Well, according to the accounting definition, they're not really investing. They're buying and selling pieces of paper. Whereas what we're talking about here is the investments, the fixed investments, in other words, the, not, not the pieces of paper, uh, the actual productive investments that firms uh, are making. As I say, mostly they used to be tangible, now they used to be intangible. So that nature of assets is changing. So you might say, well, so what? Uh, and what we wanted to point out, what we also try to point out, is that this change is hidden. So GDP still does not include most intangibles. Let's just go through a little bit of the history about how GDP is put together, and again, financial accounts are, are similar. If you went back to the 1940s, when the community of economists and national income statisticians, including Keynes himself, started developing these kinds of measures, here were the types of investments uh, which the accountants would measure. The buildings, the plant, there weren't any computers back there, but the equipment, all very tangible things. Now, gradually, some intangibles have been added in. So in 1993, it was decided that software would be treated as an investment. So British Airways, for example, when you go onto BritishAirways.com and book, that's an incredible piece of software that British Airways have got, working 24-7, processing applications, this, that, and the other. That was never treated as an investment before. Uh, now it is treated as investment. Likewise, artistic originals, and more recently, R&D. But it's taken a long time, actually, for these types of investments to become incorporated into the picture of GDP. And GDP still doesn't include some of the other types of intangible investments we just saw on the screen. So, for example, it doesn't include the investments in organization, doesn't include branding, doesn't include training. So all of these intangible investments, they are rather hidden away from uh, what we see. Uh, I mentioned something about company accounts. Uh, here's a graph uh, from a very famous professor of accounting called Baruch Lev and his co-author uh, Ferenc Gu uh, from New York University. And um, I know company accounts doesn't excite everybody all the time, but let me just walk you through this graph very quickly, if you'll forgive me. It says the following. Take the American firms who entered the US stock market in the 1950s and ask how much of their stock market value can we explain by looking at their tangible investments, their buildings and their machinery and all that kind of thing? And if, in case you can't read this, the answer is about 85% of the variation can be explained by those tangible things. Over here on the right it says, take the firms who entered the US stock market in the most recent 15 years, how much of their market value can we explain by their plant and buildings and machinery? Surprise, surprise, only about 25%. So all of this is going to show that this revolution from tangible towards intangible is uh, somewhat hidden. Now, let me just show you a little bit about this long-term trend, and then I'm going to pass over to Stephen. The long-term trend uh, looks um, a little bit uh, like this. So let me show you, first of all, um, the following data we've put together. This is tangible and intangible investment across the major economies, shares of GDP, uh, the, from 1997 up to 2013. And you can see a fairly clear trend. Tangible investment as a share of GDP is falling, falling, falling. It's on a downward tra tra trajectory. Look how abruptly it fell in the Great Recession just after 2007-2008. Uh, Intangible investment is on this rising trend here as well. In other words, by the time we got to 2013, basically for every dollar, pound or euro of tangible investment, firms in the economy were investing about a dollar, pound, or euro, about, for every dollar, one pound ten uh, um, of intangible investment. So there's been this tr trend, and indeed this little bit of overtaking. Interestingly, during the Great Recession, tangible fell enormously, intangible fell a little bit, but then recovered. So there's a divergence of experience there as well. And this is part of a long-term trend, 
which some of the American uh, uh, um, scholars have put together. Here's some data going back to the 1940s, and you can see the similar trend here. The intangible investment, which, by the way, predates the IT revolution, has been going on a steady upward trend. The tangible investment has been steady, and then you can see it's been falling uh, there as well. Uh, and so one of the things we talk about in the book is that intangible capital we think is the capital of the 21st century. Our book is called Capitalism Without Capital. There seems to be a minor industry in writing books with capital in the title, Thomas Piketty being the obvious one. Uh, and his is a fantastic book all about capital, but we think that um, he might have perhaps have emphasized the fact that the nature of capital has changed and there's much more intangible capital around. Okay, you might ask, what difference does this make and, and, and all of that? Why don't I pass over to Stian? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so, so far we've talked a lot about counting and measuring things, but the other, what we hope is an insight from our book, is that this stuff really matters to the economy, because although capital has changed a lot over time, you know, canal boats were superseded by fibre optic cables and steam engines by batteries and all sorts of things, we believe that this type of capital is different because it has quite fundamentally different economic properties. And um, we've identified four of them that we think are particularly significant. Um, we think these new types of capital, like R&D and software and so forth, are scalable, as in, once you've got something like an application, you can use it quite widely across your business. We think they're often sunk. So if, for example, you own a machine and your company goes bust, very often you can sell that machine, or your creditors can sell that machine. Much harder to do with ideas and brands and so forth. We think they have spillovers, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but very often the company that invests in a new idea doesn't have full confidence, can't have full confidence that they themselves will benefit from the ideas. Very often competitors do, very often society as a whole does. And finally, they have synergies, which is that ideas, much more so than physical things, are especially good and especially valuable when you bring them together with other ideas. And we'll talk about some specifics in a second. So we call these the four S's because it's a book and you need a framework. But um, we'll argue that this explains uh, quite a lot of things. Um, if we talk about scalability first, um, those of you who passed the past Euston will recognise the, where Addison Lee, the cab company, park up all their cars. If you run a cab company and you want to do extra business and you own your cars, you need to buy more cars. Each car can only do a certain amount of business. If, however, you run a car sharing app, your application, within reason, can scale up to an almost unlimited amount of business without needing to lay on new apps and so forth. And we find a lot of intangibles, whether they're patents or whether they're artistic originals, have this property of being very scalable. Um, the second idea is this thing about sunkenness, the fact that if you have an intangible and, for example, your business goes bust, it's worth much less to anyone else than it would be to you. Um, you'll be familiar with the story of Monarch Airlines, who very sadly went, uh, went out of business recently. Um, when Monarch Airlines went out of business, their planes were passed on to creditors almost immediately, and most of them were flying within a matter of days. Um, but their leases, the landing slots that they, uh, that they had the right to use at various airports, only last week was it determined who even owned those leases, and they're now going through a lengthy process of working out, well, will the creditors get them and so forth. And we find this is often the case with these intangibles, that the, their ownership is not clear, and consequently it's very unclear what happens to them in the case of business failure. We talked about spillovers. If you own a factory, you can stop your competitors using your factory if you don't want them to by putting a security guard outside or locking the door or anything like that. This is, this is sort of pretty basic. Um, however, if you think about something like R&D or design, that's the first iPhone invented in 2007. Um, within a year or two, other competitors were offering very similar form factors for their phones, and within a year, Google had launched Android, which from a software point of view is not wildly dissimilar to, uh, to, to the iOS that powers an iPhone. So the ability to prevent, people, prevent competitors or other people getting the benefits of your investment um, is quite limited. And although Apple have done very well out of the iPhone, a lot of people who've invested in intangibles have got very little of the benefit of their investments because fast followers have got the benefit instead. Um, and then finally, synergies. And this is an interesting one because it's a somewhat controversial story. Those of you who um, have anaphylactic reactions or have loved ones who do will be familiar with the EpiPen, the kind of injector for epinephrine, which um, uh, uh, stops anaphylaxis. Um, 
the EpiPen business is kind of proverbially and famously or infamously a very valuable business. Mylan, the company who own it, make $1.2 billion in profit a year from this, this business. And the reason they do is because the EpiPen combines a very large number of intangibles. And it's the fact that when you bring these intangibles together, they become unusually uh, valuable, which we think is interesting. So first of all, there's the kind of the discovery of the adrenaline, the epinephrine mo uh, molecule, uh, which happened at the turn of the 20th century. But it's not just R&D. There's also the design of the injector pen, which is specific and kind of um, clever in some ways. Um, there's also the brand. You know, people know what an EpiPen is. And you know, if you're in an emergency situation, it's useful that there is a shared understanding of what this device is. So people often talk about brand and marketing as if it's a kind of a bit of a scam. But you know, this is a socially useful thing that an EpiPen means something to everyone. There's also a lot of marketing and distribution, ranging from specialized holders that carry them to the kind of legal interventions. This was a 2017 act in the UK that made it possible for schools to buy backup EpiPens and, and similar devices. So there's a kind of a lot of social infrastructure behind the value here. And then finally, there's the training component, which we talked about. You know, there are specific first aid trainings to use EpiPens. And it's kind of interesting that they use the brand name in some of these trainings, which shows how, how resonant it is. So there's a lot of ethical issues here about whether people should be making this much money from emergency medicine. But it's the fact that these intangibles are synergistic that even puts that on the table. Um, Finally, what we talk about in the book and what we'd like to talk about now is what all of this means. And what we contend is that there are a lot of puzzles in the economy and things that we and everyone is concerned about um, that make a lot more sense in light of the rise of intangibles. Um, and I wanted to touch on a few of them now. We can't cover absolutely everything that's in the book. The first thing is the issue that in the economy, it's kind of widely reported, that the gap between winner and loser businesses between leaders and laggards has been massively increasing. This is some research by the OECD that kind of shows there's this really quite alarming gap between what they call frontier firms, the most profitable, the most productive firms, and the kind of the everyone else category. And there have been a few explanations that economists have typically given to this. They've sort of said maybe this is kind of slow diffusion of computing or other practices. Maybe something has kind of gone wrong about how we diffuse technology. Or maybe this is kind of corporate lobbying. and Maybe that somehow our competition policy has got less good. But we believe that actually intangibles offer an alternative and potentially more powerful explanation for a few reasons. We talked about scalability before. Well, one of the things we know is that if you own these valuable intangibles, then your business can become very big and hard to compete with. So, you know, Uber versus kind of local taxi firms or Starbucks with its brand and its operating procedures versus kind of uh, local cafes. You would imagine because these intangibles are scalable, they give an advantage to the large and the powerful in the corporate world. Um, we also talked about spillovers, how some firms can get the benefit of other firms' intangibles. Now, of course, if you look in the kind of management world, there is actually an art or a science to this. You know, you can buy books and employ consultants who will tell you about open innovation. And while open innovation is presented as a kind of a nice kind of warm feeling, sherry concept, the other way of looking at it is this is a way of benefiting from investments in ideas that other people have made. So if you imagine there are some firms that are very good at borrowing, some people call it exapting other companies' ideas, then you might imagine that those firms will do unusually well. And certainly, if we look at some of the kind of mega global corporations like Google, they're extremely good not just at developing their own ideas, but at co-opting other people's ideas and at bringing them on side. So again, a kind of advantage for the skilled and powerful. And then finally, is there's this question of synergies. If you're a firm that already has valuable intangibles, if these intangibles are better when you have more of them, again, you kind of get this Matthew effect. To those that have, more shall be given. This is a kind of little analysis that someone did recently of the top items on the App Store chart and Facebook's ownership of them. And it turned out that Facebook either had made half of these, half of these apps, had acquired them, or were, were, were cloning them. And again, it's because if these, these, these kind of intangibles, and again, Facebook's an intangible rich company, can really benefit from those kind of things. So again, a kind of perhaps alarming implication of an intangible economy that this might be really good for businesses, for example, that are already advantaged, and make it more difficult for, for, for the rest. Um, another dimension, which is kind of, I think, relevant to some of the things that, 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 that the RSA thinks about, is the question of contestability. We talked about how hard it was to work out who owned Monarch Airlines landing slots. Um, part of the reason is that human beings have not been thinking about intangibles for very long. 
This is the first human law code in a museum in Turkey, the, the code of ur -Namu on the left, who was a, uh, a Mesopotamian ruler. Um, and it describes the ownership of lots of property, of, of, of tangible properties like fields and houses and animals and alarmingly slaves, which were part of human society even then. But these are all sort of physical objects. And it shows that really for as long as human beings have been thinking about law, they've been thinking about what it means to own tangible assets. And, you know, it takes human beings time to work these things out. Um, this is the statute of Queen Anne on copyright, which is sometimes held up to be the first bit of British law on intangibles. Whether or not that's true, we basically can say that we've only been thinking as human beings about the ownership of intangibles for about 500 years. So 500 years versus 4,000 years, we've just had less time to work out the social norms and the institutions and the laws surrounding these things. And we know that in areas where ownership of stuff kind of gets contested, there is often underinvestment. There's a really fun story about the invention of barbed wire. So it turns out that in the, the west of the United States in the 19th century, um, no one really, if you were a farmer, there was very little in incentive to invest in improving your own land. Because what would happen is as soon as you invested in your own land, some cattle barons, cows, would trample over your fields, eat all the alfalfa or whatever, and then move off. So people were like, well, why would I bother spending, breaking my back digging, you know, digging crops and things like that if I can't protect them? And it turned out there was a fantastic bit of economic analysis done about what happened when barbed wire was invented, because barbed wire allowed people to build fences very cheaply that could keep out marauding cattle barons' cows. And it turned out that investment in farms rocketed as soon as this technology um, became available. And the kind of moral of that story is that if it's hard to understand what rights people have over investments and so forth, then all other things being equal, you'd expect less investment. Now, this has a really human implication because it makes us ask ourselves, well, okay, who's going to do well in an economy where, there is a pr where there's a premium put on understanding how to deal with ideas and relationships and brands? And there's kind of a few possibilities here. One is sort of, this is Elon Musk, obviously. One is sort of heroic entrepreneurs who can manage whole systems. And, you know, Elon Musk is working on solar panels and electric cars and space travel and all sorts of things. And, you know, maybe there is a premium on people if they can credibly do that. I mean, we'll see where Elon Musk gets to. Another possibility, Robert Reich, the American economist back in the 90s, talked about symbolic analysts. So this is kind of lawyers, white-collar workers, yuppies, who are very good at managing the claims over different assets. And if you, people wonder why there are so many white-collar people nowadays, if you think about David Graeber's very interesting work on bullshit jobs, jobs that seem to involve pushing paper around, one possible reason why there's so much pushing paper around, maybe this isn't a kind of a, a, a conspiracy, maybe it's because establishing ownership over these claims has become more important. Another interesting dimension is, um, sorry, is um, political connections. This is Neely Kreuss, the former European Union commissioner who went to work for Uber. If you're Uber and if you're negotiating these various complex, and as we've seen in recent months, contested claims, employing people with political connections may be a smart move. Um, somewhat alarming that that's the case, but you would imagine that there would be more of this in this kind of economy. Um, we also find that the psychological trait of openness to experience, being interested in new things and making connections, is something which seems to be a recipe for success in, um, in, in, in the intangible economy. And then finally, touching on some of the very interesting work that's been done at the RSA and that Rowan has led, um, the concept of systems innovators. Um, some of you will know the work of the Point People, Cassie Robinson's organisation, who've been thinking really deeply about how to think systemically, not in a kind of heroic entrepreneur, Elon Musk must control everything way, but to be able to negotiate complex systems and work with large groups of people to make really profound change happen. And again, that's something that you would see being potentially more important in an intangible economy. Um, a few quick things, mindful of time. We would also expect cities to become more important in this kind of economy because spillovers, if there's knowledge to be shared, you want to be near other people with the knowledge, and if there's a benefit to combining knowledge through the synergies, then again, you want to be closely proximate. Um, this kind of creates some interesting public policy problems. It means that the cost on the economy of planning restrictions will become even higher. That's some uh, developments in Docklands that were blocked because local residents wanted to protect that very valuable petrol station on the Isle of Dogs. So those kind of problems would become a bigger deal in an intangible economy and more costly. Um, but there's a paradox here. Um, those of you who know Camden will know the Black Cap, a kind of famous um, cabaret pub 
which um, has been under threat of closure for quite some time now um, because they want to redevelop it into flats, probably because they think, oh, well, there's some great synergies to be had and maybe we can sell these flats to people. But if we close down all these third spaces and cultural venues, then where are people going to meet to exchange these synergies and spillovers and make the benefits of these cities? So there's a kind of a paradox here. We kind of want to build more so that we can benefit from large cities. But if you build more by taking out all your cultural venues and third spaces and places like the RSA, then, um, then, then, then you may kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Um, and we do find some interesting things going on in cities. So Youngstown was the kind of steel capital of Ohio in the 20th century. That was a kind of classic example of a tangible era cluster. Everyone did, everyone made steel, um, and that was what the city was mainly about. But what we're finding, rec what we're finding more recently, so this is some really interesting research by Shane Greenstein about patenting in the US. And it turns out that now the innovation clusters don't just do one thing in the US. They, if you judge by the patent evidence, uh, do work in all sorts of areas. So the blue line here is Silicon Valley. And it turns out that Silicon Valley not only is increasing the amount of patenting it does, one measure of innovation and tangible investment, but they're also doing lots of stuff that isn't traditional Silicon Valley stuff, lots of non-ICT patenting. Um, of course, all of this has some pretty significant cultural and political dimensions. This is um, the bits of America that voted for Hillary Clinton in the election. Um, and if we're seeing a situation where these metropolitan areas are going to do better and better out of the intangible economy, then you could imagine that this will exacerbate the kind of the, 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 the traditional cultural divide between rural and urban. And we think that this kind of combination of a long-standing cultural divide between the town and the country and this kind of newer economic pressure is perhaps one of the reasons why the culture wars are getting more intense and why we're seeing such big geographical divides in, in politics. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip talking about IP, but we can talk about it later. But I do want to just flag up the issue of public investment because if we take this spillovers argument seriously, if we think that all other things being equal, it's harder for any individual company to get the benefits of their own investment in an intangible economy, then you would expect the case for government investment to be greater. And indeed, we see places that invest more in public R&D, one type of intangible, so if the government spends more taxpayers' money on R&D, that you see more intangible investment generally. And again, if more and more investment in the economy is is, is, is of a sort that it's harder for firms to get the benefit of, you would see a fairly strong case for increasing public investment. Um, now, of course, we do quite a lot of public R&D in most rich countries, but there are kind of bigger questions about, well, how do you do investment in organisational development from a public point of view? How do you do investment in cultural capital? Is that more BBC, more things like that? It's an it's a interesting and open question. There's also the question of how do you do it well and in an economy where, or a society where there are greater divides between, as we've seen before, the kind of metropolitan elite and the left behind, how do you build the political consensus for that? So a kind of dilemma. We don't have the answer, but at least it's an important question to work on. Um, anyway, there are, there's much more in the book. We talk about links between this in secu and secular stagnation, um, the whole question of how you finance an intangible economy, We've got lots of anecdotes about gyms and CT scanners and the Beatles and all sorts of things and what it means for managers and for policymakers. But we don't want to give everything away here, particularly because we're only because we're I'm running over time, but happy to discuss any of that in the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. I don't think I didn't hear you, Stian, when you said, you know, if we take out the third spaces like the RSA, you know, the world would fall apart. I was thinking, well, why would you be taking out the RSA? Um, but it is interesting, some of the things you ended on, just a, a bit of a bombshell there around, you know, the implications of the intangible economy on inequality in places, um, specifically alluding to this idea of citadels of the liberal elite. Um, in your book, you talk about inequality of income and wealth and of esteem, in fact, but you do also really focus on places and how cities might, um, might come up with some new ideas, throwing up questions about how, and it throws up questions about how cities can really deliver on a promise of inclusive growth, which many cities, certainly in the UK, but we see globally, are really struggling with, when actually you have this kind of mirror economy going on that's more more platform orientated so 
Can you, can you think about how might you advise city mayors or those working on trying to deliver against inclusive growth on how to invest in intangible, potentially in social infrastructure, you talk about social and cultural capital. Where, where do they start? What do they, what do they think? Shall I? Um, I, think that's, I think this is a really important question and it's one that's going to get more and more important as this intangible economy gets bigger. I think one thing we, we know about cities is that if spillovers and the kind of exchange of knowledge matters for economic growth, then you kind of want cities to be as well connected as possible. And frankly, certainly for the time being, that is still about physical connections. So one priority would be the basics of getting things right, like local transport. And we know that's something when we listen to city mayors in the UK, um, that's, some, that's often a priority for them. And that's kind of, a, I think that's one particularly important thing. Um, but by the same token, kind of cultural spaces, places where people can come together and look and build kind of clusters, that's another important type of policy intervention. Um, I think the real, the, 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 the real divide, the real inequality that we'll see is between cities that don't get that right, that don't manage to get this critical mass, um, and the ones that do. And I think the real challenge for mayors and city leaders is to say, how do we, how do we make sure that we're in the group that, that, that manages to build that connectivity? Mm. And, then, and then for those who are in rural areas, what, where, where do you, because maybe those economies of scale exist in cities, yeah. but, but outside. Yeah. It's a really good question, and one of the things that was fascinating reading this book is we read a lot of people who talked about networked economies and things in the early 1990s, and back then, this idea of the death of distance was seen as um, a kind of almost inevitable consequence of the IT revolution. You know, soon we'll all be telecommuting and this kind of thing. And of course, it kind of very famously hasn't happened. You know, if you look at uh, places like Shoreditch or Silicon Valley or wherever, these are very geographical, they're, they're very place-based clusters. And I guess one, one question is, if you're, de if you're, if you're someone like the uh, somewhere like the Highlands and Islands where you can't achieve that kind of agglomeration. One question is how can we use technology to mitigate that and I think sort of people like Highlands and Islands Enterprise have been doing really interesting work in terms of how to bring people together despite those uh, despite that lack of connection. I think the other question is how to build links to businesses that are in other areas so how to get those businesses involved in supply chains, how to get them socially connected um, because that can mitigate some of the, um, the, the, the problem of distance. No, absolutely. Although it brings up the question of, of cultural venues and, and third spaces, as you re referred to them before. Um, it's been, I was thinking a lot when looking through your book around the real economy and what the real economy versus this intangible economy, or indeed, you know, many times when you talk of intangibles, it, you're also referring, when, specifically when you're referring to the question of scale, around platforms and how platforms can take out markets because effectively they have the concentration of the network, but they have none of the, the sunk costs or the, the, tra you know, the, the tragedy of having a million Addison League taxis. Um, it's not really a tragedy. Um, but the, you know, what, you, what you talk about there is the advantage of large and powerful brands. You know, scalability wins in that, in that state. So where, where's the space and the implications for the real economy and the high street around this? I mean, I, I am a, an independent pub landlady on my spare time, which is, I would advise no one to ever do <laughs> such a thing. But this is a, of an issue of, of deep concern to me in that particular role um, because we have a lot of physical capital, structural assets that we have to maintain, and they can be replaced by agile and intangible challenger businesses, you know, pop-ups that can ha host ha large brands. How do, you, how do we maintain the real economy that has physical assets? Because that is also our cultural capital. You know, we want to go to venues and have exist in a real world, not just a virtual world. So, so, so let me offer a thought on that. I mean, as Stian set out in the slides, as we try to set out in the book, one of the things that you know, the Starbucks and the big pub chains and all that kind of thing can do is they can bring together the synergies from intangible assets and branding and all, the, and, and, and all those kinds of things. They can bring together efficient supply chains to maybe make, make the beer cheaper and all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, I speak as an economist here, thank goodness that consumers, one thing that consumers like is they like variety. So actually, they might be persuaded to go to these bigger stores, but they also might be persuaded to go to local pubs and all that kind of thing as well. So it's that kind of coexistence of the two, which I think keeps these things somewhat in balance. Uh, 
Um, but the ability, as I say, uh, as Stephen was saying, you know, of these bigger chains to scale up and do all those kinds of things does certainly tip from a cost point of view and from an attractiveness point of view for the people who like that kind of thing. It tips the advantage uh, towards them. And so not surprisingly, we see the emergence of, you know, Starbucks, Uber, you know, the, the, these much, uh, these, these very big scaled up firms. And, and we see them with Tesco and Amazon. We see them with, with we talked about Topshop and Assos, you know, the difference between having to host all of this physical infrastructure and then a, an online challenger business being able to just take out the market. And those are not, you can never level the playing field with the intangible economy. Um, I mean, it, it plays a little bit more. This is going to sound like a terrible story of, of doom and gloom, and I'm trying to bring some, think of some very positive question, people. Um, <laughs> The, the 4S framework that you, you give, I've talked about scale, but, but when I was reflecting on the different parts of it, it shows rather a kind of quadruple bind. You know, ideas that have spillover benefits could be nicked. You know, um, if you have synergies, who's going to take the credit? If you're sunk costs, if you sunk costs and then copycats scale it, which is the kind of Topshop and, and ASOS type thing, you know, ASOS... ASOS is as seen on screen, which effectively is saying, we are copying what we see on the telly. Um, and they, you know, how do you get investors to invest uh, and put money into kind of the transformative innovation. So those things that are going to be bold and new when actually that's really where you, you can, it's the greatest risk lie. So um, I think this is another really important question. And we've got a chapter in the book where you talk about, well, how do you finance this type of economy? Um, and I think it's interesting to take a bit of a historical perspective on this because um, if we think back to, we tell the story of the invention of the CT scanner, the medical device. And the CT scanner was invented by EMI, the, what we think of now as a record company, but back then it stood for Electrical and Mechanical in uh, Industries, and they made everything from kettles to, they were the Beatles uh, record publisher. And the money that they made from being the Beatles record producer allowed them, among other things, to basically fund um, Godfrey Hounsfield, the developer of the CT scanner, who kind of invented the CT scanner. And the tragic story is that EMI made virtually no money out of the CT scanner, despite investing in the R&D and the marketing and all those other intangibles, um, because GE and Siemens kind of ended up out-competing them in the business. But that was a really interesting sort of story of how companies used to work. Um, because they were willing to kind of recycle their own cash and invest in what turned out to be almost blue sky research because they didn't make they didn't make the money from it. Um, I think on the whole, because shareholder value has become more important to businesses, large companies are less willing to do that. Um, so that, in one sense, is a problem because, as you say, you know, who's going to invest in these in these in these big ideas? I think we can see a few examples of where that investment is currently coming from. One, there is one set of companies that seems to be able to get away with making these investments, that equity markets tolerate them making the investments, and that's kind of high-tech growth stocks. The big companies like Google and Facebook seem to get away with this. Investment analysts seem to treat them differently. Tesla is a kind of fantastic story of a publicly traded company that basically seems to walk on air from the point of view of shareholder value. Um, and um, there, there seems to be some categories that, that make an exception there. There is some really interesting work done by the economist Alex Edmonds at London Business School, who's looked at when stock markets are more willing to tolerate this kind of blue sky investment by companies. And his research seems to suggest that where analysts, where, where shareholders can spend more time actually really understanding what the company does, they're much more willing to tolerate this kind of blue sky, broader investment than if you're dealing with kind of low information investors who don't trade very much. So, for example, he has argued that under those circumstances, we want to see much more institutional investment, far more companies taking bigger stakes in companies so that they can actually, uh, so that they can um, spend the time investing and in really understanding their business. And that certainly tallies with what I've heard from company CFOs as well. Now, the other kind of group of people who are willing to countenance these kind of investments in private markets are venture capitalists who basically seem to sort of say, well, our business model is we're going to take lots of big bets. And we know we're comfortable with the idea of spillovers. We know that very often we won't make a lot of money on these investments, but one or two of them will really pay off because of the scalability. And so I guess that is another potential source of these, of, of these kinds of capital. But I think the fallback, which we were talking about earlier, is 
If you can't mitigate that problem of spillovers, then you'd expect to see over time more public investment in things like R&D. And to a great extent, that is what, for the most part, rich countries are doing. They're gradually investing more in R&D. Mm. And I guess that, that place, that, that question around system innovators and how you can take a system that currently has a set of quite um, structured rules or, or rules that are lagging rules um, and then can start to understand how to be more agile in its, in its measure, metrics. You know, we, we listen to the Today programme. The Today programme will talk about key indicators, GDP, productivity, and these things are all challenged by what you have, have written about in your book. I'm interested if these old metrics, you know, are are con continuously being replaced. And it's not just that they are being replaced by a single set of intangibles, but that actually they're being rapidly and accelerate accelerated into new, new areas. How can we look to measure with a level of certainty? So when we talk about markets, we, the market's always saying, well, the market wants certainty. But actually what you're saying is intangible assets create uncertainty by default. So how? How will we get our regulators and policymakers to start to understand how to account for this kind of stuff. So, so, so can I say a word, quick word on that? Uh, I, 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 so I should say I'm a member of the UK Statistics Authority, which runs the ONS, so I'm, I, don't know whether I'm con I don't know whether I'm conflicted on all of this, but um, uh, so I, of course the ONS is doing a fantastic job. I just want to tell you all there before, before we start the answer. Um, so, so I think the answer is, and we try and set this out in the book, is... If you want to remain within the framework of GDP, there are some things you can do to fix GDP up a little bit. So you could measure intangibles a bit better. The digital economy has got a series of challenges, you know, around getting, measuring prices correctly. And then especially for GDP, where there are free goods like Wikipedia and free apps to download and things to watch live streaming and all that kind of thing, we don't know what the price is. That's very difficult for GDP because GDP typically we take the price of things. So there is a series of adjustments that you could do to GDP if you want to remain with it within that framework. Um, and Stian and I also worked on the Indigo Prize that you kindly mentioned in the introduction, uh, Rowan, where we set out some plans to do all of that. If, on the other hand, you want to throw away GDP altogether and do something much more radical, then it seems to me we're in another, you know, we're in another place, essentially. And then I think one has to think much harder about how to measure welfare under those you know, sets of situations or what it is you want to measure instead of GDP. But I think a lot of ideas um, y you know, in the book could be brought to the table on that. So the other, the, the other winners of the Indigo Prize that you, you mentioned was Diane Coyle uh, and um, Benmitra Khan, who's an intellectual property uh, chief economist uh, in Australia. And there they talked about a rather different approach to this measurement of GDP and this measurement of issues, which is around a series of assets and asking the question, what, could we measure a series of assets to which our citizens might want, we would, would, would want them to have access to? Some of those assets would be tangible assets in the way we've described. Some would be intangible assets. Others would be environmental assets, for example. Others would be social capital and all those kinds of things. So again, I think the intangible side has got a place in that broader uh, um, uh, uh, kind of concept. Um, but again, that's going quite a long way beyond GDP. So that's something to be thought about, but that's quite a big, uh, quite a big question. There are, there are I, I think that that's one of the good things about this book is it, it doesn't just describe the problem. There are some notions of how one might take some, um, some routes towards changing the system. So, um, right, over to the audience. We have a gentleman here, gentleman there. Oh, have we got any ladies? Think of some questions. Um, so we'll start with you. Hi. Um, picking up on your point, Jonathan, and Rome, what you just said, it's what really interests me. Because you're talking about intangibles within an existing system and a system that is increasingly failing. So I would like to take a play of your use of words and look at intangibles without capitalism. Because you're trying to fit something that naturally doesn't fit this system. I would argue, uh, and actually, should we be looking at wholesale system? I, mean, I don't think it's that radical to consider looking beyond GDP. I think we need to be a whole lot more radical uh, and change our whole concept of investment and not think of investment as something that is a unit of money to actually be we're investing in different ways. Can, can, I, yeah. can, can I give a... I'm going to give a really boring response to that, and I'm sure, and I'm sure Stian, can think, Stian can think of something much more interesting. 
Um, within GDP, we do know how to think about investment. That is to say, it's something, as we were talking earlier on, it's not buying stocks and shares. It's something which you know, a company will do to build an asset which will give it some long-term benefits. So as Stian was saying, when Monarch buys some jet airliners, it owns an asset which gives it a long-term benefit, namely a flow of airline services, which it can then offer over the years. But the same is true with intangibles, and that's why we fit our intangibles framework very much into GDP. That's what we do in the book. When, let's take Monarch again, when they invest in some software, I mentioned British Airways, Monarch has software as well, that's going to give it a flow of uh, services, the things that it can do to sell to its customers and all that. So all of that fits in within the GDP type of framework. It's just it's an investment which accountants find so difficult to measure that we've, the research that we talk about in the book that we've done uh, you know, has to go beyond what accountants are sort of trying to do. So in that respect, I think it fits within the general framework. If we want to jump outside that framework, I'm, I'm open to any suggestions. But, Can I quickly uh, jump but why don't you go in? Framework. Exactly. So I think it's a really perceptive point, and it picks, for me, it sort of resonates with some of the interesting, almost more potentially right-leaning critiques of the concept of capitalism from people like Deirdre McCloskey or... Um, uh, the recent, uh, the, uh, the, who's sort of said, well, actually, what we call capitalism isn't really about capital at all. It's, a, it's an economy about coming up, it's an economy that's to do with ideas. And um, if I think of, if you come across Bill Janeway's book, uh, doing, what's he called it? He calls it Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy. And his sort of argument is, well, the actual, the, if you look at the last 200 years of, 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 of the economy, 250 years, I say, inspired by the RSA and its history, um, it's actually about innovation much more than it is about, about capitalism. So I think that's a very good challenge that we should be thinking about, you know, how do we characterise what, what currently exists in the economy? Beyond the boundaries of our knowns. Over there, gentlemen. Question about Uber. When they launch, they figure out that they have to grow faster than the virality that they have in the application. And they put a stupid amount of money buying coupons to create both demand and supply. And technically, they lost money doing that, but they acquired both vir virality, market share, and they changed the speed of the, and they changed the acceleration. Now, if you look at the books, they lost money. If you look at the assets, they don't have assets, but they have a sunken cost of investment of having created a system before the lobbying and the opposition of the cities and the black cabs, whatever they are, or yellow cabs, could cope. So how do you account for those kind of investments? So um, I think that's a superb example, and it's one that we thought, of, thought about quite a lot as we, were as we were planning the book. And to me, there's this term in these, these, this intangible framework called organisational development. And I think when it was initially conceived of, it was thought about investment within a firm, within a company. But actually, if we look at a lot of the value in some of the absolute mega corporations, they're about relationships with their supply chain. So Uber's relationship with its drivers, Apple's relationship with its vast and occasionally exploited supply chain around the world, which seem to be incredibly valuable and incredibly important for their competitive advantage. So I would be tempted to say that, that is, that's probably captured in that organisational development term, but to me it's definitely an intangible investment. Yeah. And, and scale, of course. You know, Uber have managed to scale it up enormously, so I think it's an example. It, it puts our framework to use in, in, in our view. This gentleman there. Question: How does the state capture value from intangibles through taxation in a much more effective way than it does at the moment? Because we've seen a lot in the press about the, the Ubers of this world, the Starbucks of this world, moving money around, and uh, you know those businesses have a lot of intangibles in them. So I just wondered if you have any thoughts about that in the book. Quick question, big answer, I'd say. Yeah. Um, uh, this at the risk of sounding Panglossian, I think actually the the one, good, one tax is a bit like the kind of law code of Ernamu. Er, it's something human beings have been doing for quite a long time. So I'm always reluctant to throw out tax and look at other ways of raising revenue for these things. But I think that, you know, if you look at things like BEPS, the kind of international work on how to prevent shifting of intangible assets between jurisdictions, I think that's actually quite good work. It's quite dull and it's not sort of revolutionary, but it probably is the kind of steady staff work that if we, you know, keep resourcing it well and keep backing it up with solid diplomacy, it will help mitigate some of these things. I think you know, there's a case for saying we need to make sure that our tax authorities kind of keep up along that, uh, uh, we were talking about regulation earlier, that they, that they are 
sufficiently informed about how things are working in the new economy, but I think it does require them to be on the front foot because, as you say, otherwise these intangible assets are very easy to move between jurisdictions and to conceal. Gentlemen. Thank you. May I know from the speakers what accounts for the longevity of capitalism, considering that communism lasted only 72 years? Okay. Do you want to? I, 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 so, I think a conventional economist like me would tell you that the central planning element of communism meant that these types of ideas exchange and all of that were just unable to flourish. It, it, uh, uh, as, as we tried to say, and as sort of Stian set out, one of the ways, one of the S's being synergies, that is to say, if you put all this stuff together, you get these unexpected gains. We talk about the microwave oven, for example. Uh, that's not something which planners can do. That seems to be something which, I'm not going to be much of an evangelist for free markets, but in this respect I will be. Planners just can't plan for you know, an incredibly unlikely set of uh, uh, circumstances where you know, technologies are swapped and then new, new technologies come along. So... I think those elements of the communist system were, you know, uh, those elements of the communist system didn't let, you know, growth and innovation flourish, and those economies just languished. And we should put in a plug for Francis Spufford's excellent book, Red Plenty, about yes. the use of computation in the Soviet Union, for anyone who hasn't read it, because it's great. Here, here. Uh, gentlemen in the back, we've now got millions, and, and that clock is actually five minutes slow, everybody. So, just in case you're thinking you've got lots more time than you do. So, we'll start with this gentleman, and then I think we might have time. The gentleman in the front and the back. Thank you. My name's Malcolm Aiken. I've been involved with the Environment Awards that the RSA has won for a long time. And we did that because we thought that if we encouraged people to innovate in the environment, then we would get a green economy. Well, we have done terribly well in Europe. We've done better than any other European country in the European Awards for which we select the UK entries, but we don't have the green economy. And it seems to me that much of that environmental innovation is intangible. And of these four S's that you've put forward, the scalability works for first mover advantage, but the other three don't. And so... To an extent, your comment about um, Tesla running on air, is that because the people think they've got a first mover advantage when they haven't re really? And if that's true, then why would a country be any better at investing in those intangible investments than a corporation or an individual be? Because as our experience with environmental awards shows, the payback doesn't seem to come. I think this is a synergy story. I think this is um, to get, if we want to move to a low carbon economy, we obviously need to get lots of things right, whether that's the transport system, charging for cars, if that's going to be part of the generation of energy, load balancing and so forth, as you will know better than I do. And um, as we've seen, it's difficult to coordinate all of those things. And Elon Musk is trying to do this through a sort of heroic entrepreneur model. And, you know, maybe that will work, maybe it won't. Um, there's a kind of an emerging sort of practice of systems innovators who are trying to do it in a kind of more nuanced and socially grounded way. Um, that seems to be a kind of hopeful development. There is a role of government as a systems innovator. And, you know, we saw the announcement yesterday of government attempting to kind of, we've been trying to get the electric car charging systems to work. Um, I, I think all of those three things will probably play a role, but I, I can't predict which one's going to work. But um, I think it's the synergies that, that, that are at the root of that problem. The, there is a microphone there, then a gentleman in the front, and then we're going to end to the lady. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, my name's Will Page, Chief Economist at Spotify, which, going back to your earlier slide, is a company that's done very well since the iPhone was launched. Um, but I want to go back to an earlier slide before that, which is you showed how, in the recession, the tangible economy collapsed, but the in intangible economy stabilised and actually grew. Do you think that same observation can apply to labor market statistics so you have this fear that tech destroys more jobs than it creates but the labor market stats are there to measure the tangible economy where destruction happens and are ill-prepared to measure the intangible economy where the job creation happens 
given time, let me give a very quick answer to that. Thank, thank, thanks for the question. I think the trouble with the labour market statistics is that the boundaries between you know, market work and non-market work in the digital world are very difficult. So labour market statistics typically measure, I turn up at a factory, measure my hours. If I'm at home working on you know, building apps, writing Wikipedia, doing some part-time work, labour market statistics aren't quite so well set up to measure that. So very short answer to a very nice question. And we're sorry we skipped over the slide that said how great Spotify was. Yeah. That was the one we skipped over, but it is. Gentleman in front and then the lady <laughs> in the second row. Um, if intangible assets are such an important and growing part of the mic up, sorry, put it to you. Put it to you if the intangible assets are such a growing and important part of the GDP and that they are by their very definition hard to value, can we conclude that the GDP numbers we're getting, 1.5% and low productivity, are actually missing it? Because that's what the stock market's telling us. The stock market's surging while we're seeing all this bad news, and it's something, there's a big disconnect going on. So again, great question, I'll give a very quick answer, uh, which is, of course, the stock market goes up and down, so it's very difficult to back out intangible estimates uh, uh, directly from the stock market unless one has a long period. What we try to do in the book is we try and essentially re-engineer the national accounts in order to count all this stuff, and we do find that there is an undercount, but there isn't as big an undercount as you'd think, so it doesn't completely transform the GDP statistics, but it is an undercount nonetheless. But we do think it helps explain secular stagnation for reasons we probably don't have time to go into here, but we can talk about afterwards if it's helpful. And our final question. My question is actually about finance. Because um, at the moment, we appear to be having something of a boom in a particular form of capital raising that we haven't seen before. And we don't quite know where it's going to end, but boy, is it rocketing. <laughs> and it seems to be being used essentially to fund... All, other, all kinds of intangible investment that we haven't thought about before either. I'm referring to the ICO boom in cryptocurrencies, and I was wondering if you two would like to comment on that. <laughs> in, in about one minute, how you, how you can do that. Shall I <laughs> give it a go? I'll try and think of an answer. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not an ICO or blockchain expert. When I look at it, I can sort of see there is a bit of a potential winner takes all argument that if a if you can if you can establish a blockchain based currency as some kind of dominant medium of exchange then somehow you can you can you, that will be unusually valuable and if you happen to own a bunch of those tokens already then you'll 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 do very well so there's probably a bit of an intangible argument there i am pretty sympathetic to the arguments that sort of say well this does look a bit like a um a, this there are strong reasons to be skeptical that investing in the, probably most ICOs are not going to end well, um, so I can sort of I can sort of buy that, but which is kind of what you expect if you if you think that intangibles like an ICO network have a winner take all effect. That you know if you're lucky and your ICO works out, then maybe you could do well, but you might not. Okay, well, thank you for your broad range of diverse and challenging questions. We always like that at the RSA. Um, I think it's our USP to keep you on your toes. Um, and uh, sadly, we have run out of time, even though the clock says otherwise. Um, Jonathan and Stian will be here to sign copies of their book in the lobby if you would like to stop by and say hello. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking Jonathan Haskell and Stian Osterich.